Welcome to this Architecture Today webinar with Geberit, Noise Matters, Optimising Acoustic Performance. If at any point you have any difficulties viewing this webinar, please click on the chat bot bottom right of your screen and one of our technical support team will help you via live chat. So let's get started with the chair of this webinar, Ruth Slavid. Thank you very much, Dave. I'm delighted to be chairing this on behalf of Architecture Today and Geberit. And I think it's a really interesting subject because I think acoustics can be a bit of a Cinderella. We look at architects' drawings, at visualisations and even at finished buildings. And the one thing we cannot see is what the buildings sound like. And we all know how important that is. We know it's really important in terms of performance spaces, those spaces we all used to enjoy, but no longer go to, unfortunately. But I don't think enough attention is given to how other, uh, other spaces sound. And I know this is something that uh, Gebrit have been looking at because they recently commissioned a survey of 2000 people and they found an extraordinary number who found that the sound inside their homes was disturbing. And in a lot of cases, it kept them awake. And they also found that a lot of that noise was noise that was coming from bathrooms, people being woken up by flushing toilets in the night, etc. But we will be hearing more about that later. And we will have the opportunity to download the report that they've done. Now, I'm just going to talk to you briefly about how today is going to work. I'm going to introduce the first speaker in a minute. And in fact, we'll have two speakers and then we will take questions for those two speakers. And then we will have our final two speakers and we will take questions for them as well. And if you at any point want to ask a question, uh, please do so. There is an ask a question button on your screen and do please send it in. We love your questions and it's good to challenge our speakers. Anyway, without more ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker who is Dr. Anthony Chilton, who is senior partner at Max Fordham and an acoustic specialist. And I think he'll have a lot of fascinating things to tell us. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Um, so uh, the title I'm talking today um, is about noise matters. And, and um, it's a good title in that I'm obviously gonna be arguing that it does matter. Uh, I just wanted to say at the outset though, that there's, there's more to the story than just noise. Um, for acousticians, noise specifically is the word that we use to refer to unwanted sound. And, and clearly a big part of acoustic design is reducing and controlling unwanted sound. But we're also interested in enhancing some sounds because sound is actually a very important part of how occupants connect with their environment. And it's an important positive factor in how people experience a, a building. So um, I'm going to be talking about optimizing acoustic performance particularly in terms of the design process and the briefing process. Um, so first up, I probably ought to say why we ought to be interested in um, improving acoustics. Um, better acoustics leads to better well-being. Um, it can improve productivity. Um, that's obvious for workplaces, but also if, um, if you live um, in a home that doesn't allow you to sleep properly, that's obviously going to affect your productivity the next day. There's lots of research showing that that bad acoustics lead to poor health outcomes. Um, and just generally having good acoustics is part of um, the enjoyment of, of buildings and the built environment. So just conceptually looking at this kind of scale running from what I'll, I'll refer to as poor acoustics up to good acoustics. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that in a minute. Um, where do we wanna be on this scale? Um, so. Obviously, we don't want to end up at this bottom end where we've got uncomfortable spaces or spaces which are just completely unusable for the purposes um, that we intend them for. But that's kind of setting a low bar. And um, and then it's a question of starting from, from there, how much do we want to enhance from that point um, up to the top end of the scale? Um, and obviously, I'm an acoustician. I'm, you know, why wouldn't I say, just go straight to the top? Why, why bother messing about? But the reason being is that, um, Obviously, in any real situation, there's generally some kind of trade-off to be have. That's design. That's the design process. Um, improving acoustics is, is almost certainly going to result in some kind of trade-off with another aspect of the design. So a couple of simple examples of that are, firstly, cost, um, uh, including some kind of acoustic intervention 
does generally cost money. As a simple example, you might want to add secondary glazing to your home to reduce uh, breaking of external noise. Um, leads to better acoustics, but that secondary glazing will cost you money. Um, the second one is, is visual impact. Um, so sometimes acoustic um, measures can be at odds with the visual intent for the building. So for example, it, it, the acoustics might dictate that it can't be quite as open visually as that you might want it to be, um, or that we might be placing demands on surface finishes. Sometimes acoustics can be um, at odds with other aspects of the environmental design. So a simple example of that would be um, if acoustically it's better that you don't open your windows uh, to avoid letting in noise, then that then places a, a challenge on how you can achieve comfortable internal temperatures. And finally, an important one is that um, enhancing acoustics can unwittingly result in higher carbon emissions, either in used carbon emissions or embodied carbon. So a simple example of that would be that um, 300 mil of in situ concrete slab is great acoustically, we like that, um, but clearly um, it doesn't fare as well in terms of embodied carbon as 150 mil cross laminated timber um, slab. Um, so how do, we, how do we make the judgment there between those two factors? So that's largely to do with design. The next point is about this briefing issue. So having uh, established that there's um, design issues to be considered in the process, who decides where we want to be on this scale um, and how do they make that decision? And so it's fairly obvious to me that it ought to be the people who are using the building, so the end users or the client that should be making that decision. And they ought to be making the decision as in, in a way where they're as best informed as they can be about the implications for them in terms of the acoustic benefits. Um, so this second point is really about um, communication and briefing. Uh, and the first point is about design and collaboration. So um, I mentioned good acoustics. What does good acoustic mean? Um, so if you let an acoustician uh, design a building on their own with no input from anybody else, this is what they come up with. Um, it's an anechoic test lab. Um, and that's great acoustically. You know, there's no no noise at all. Um, very high levels of sound insulation, and basically no reverberation either, because everything's covered in acoustic foam wedges. Um, but clearly, that's not a design that's appropriate for a normal building. And the reason for that is that definition of what we're saying good acoustics is there is far too narrow, and it focuses far too much on eliminating noise. And it's coming back to that thing I was saying before that it kind of ignores this issue about that that sound and feedback from your environment in terms of sound. Um, and your soundscape is important. The other thing it completely ignores is any other aspects of, of well-being. So there's no natural daylight, um, no visual openness. Um, so how do we, what's a better strategy for defining what we want to achieve acoustically for a building? So what we found um, increasingly is that taking a well-being based approach to this uh, can be helpful. Um, so what we do is we start from um, what Max Warden call uh, their well-being canvas. Um, and what that is, is it simply um, takes uh, an occupant's needs and kind of intrinsic motivations and splits those into three broad categories um, that you can see here. So mastery is about the feeling that, that a space supports your ability to do the task that you want to do in that space. So it helps you to master a task effectively. So that might be as simple as, it's if it's a place for sleep is that if the task is sleep it allows you to sleep um, autonomy is about um, control and choice so it might be about having a choice of a range of spaces with different acoustic uh, conditions or at least having control over your own local environment uh, and finally relatedness to others um, is fairly self-explanatory so so coming from those th three intrinsic needs um, we then try and interpret those for a particular type of building in terms of the acoustic conditions in the space. Um, so we look then at things like comfort and control and acoustic character. Um, things like privacy and avoidance of distraction are important for how you undertake tasks and your choice about the way you do it. Uh, speech intelligibility is obviously very central to a lot of human activities and in fact could probably cut across all three of these categories. And then finally looking at 
things like positive soundscape design. And so once we've, we've had this discussion, we can then translate the outcomes into um, acoustic parameters that we, we can use as a basis for designing the building. So the advantage of doing it like this is it, it just gives you a framework uh, for engaging with clients. Uh, it kind of gives you a language that you can use um, for the discussion to try and um, uh, get them to describe what has value to them acoustically. It can be um, helped quite a lot by the use of oralization. Oralization is the acoustic equivalent of visualization. So it's it's using um, generally computer generated um, audio simulations, what a space might sound like depending on the different design options so that somebody can come listen to that and make a subjective assessment um, about how that suits them in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Uh, the final point is that it's a general process. So those three intrinsic needs are a general idea. So they should be applicable to any type of building provided you interpret um, how they relate to acoustic requirements for that type of building. So, um, so having looked at kind of the process, I was gonna quickly um, give a couple of project examples. Firstly, um, a residential one, and then um, uh, a couple of office ones. Um, so this is uh, Burridge Gardens, it's a Hawkins Brown uh, project, 538 new homes. So the, the important aspect of this project is it's right alongside the main um, train line out of Clapham Junction. And that is a very busy section of track. I think in terms of train movements, one of the busiest in Europe. Um, so this is the site and Clapham Junction is up the top right of this image, the station. And then, so this is the train line, which is the principal source of noise. So we're quite fortunate on this project in the sense that we were involved quite early in the process. And uh, one of the, the first things we asked is, is it possible to put uh, a noise barrier along the edge of this site? Um, I mean, so it's not rocket science, it's a pretty obvious thing to do, um, but we did a bit of early stage modeling just to confirm that that would be an effective strategy in terms of seal, um, shielding the rest of the site uh, from the principal source of noise. And then the advantage then obviously then is you can populate the rest of the site with the other blocks and they are much less exposed um, to, um, to environmental noise uh, than they would be otherwise. So the key point there is that um, I'm trying to make it the point that if you have early stage strategic input acoustically, then um, you can minimize the degree of trade-off that you need to consider. So there's always going to be some sort of trade-off, but if you can design it out early on, then the proportion of dwellings that that is an issue for is much reduced. Um, so that is a good approach to take if possible. You still get left with a facade which is exposed to the noise. So we have to look at the, the sound insulation of that facade. In terms of wintertime design, that's not particularly difficult. It's just about defining an appropriate um, glazing specification. The, the challenging issue is the summertime situation, because obviously then you want to open your window to keep yourself cool, and then you're at risk of noise ingress from these train passes, including um, uh, freight trains going past at night. So just looking at that in terms of this kind of design process that I was talking about before, so the first thing we we pointed out was that if you have opening windows as your strategy for keeping cool, then you've got an acoustic comfort issue. Um, an obvious alternative to that would be seal up the facade and have mechanical cooling instead. Um, but the client um, uh, immediately said that they weren't keen on that uh, from a sustainability point of view, but also from a in-use uh, energy costs, so electricity bills for, for residents. Um, so we came up with this sort of third strategy, which is to use um, acoustic vents. So these are, are still passive, as in um, they don't have any fans, and they're kind of like an alternative to windows, uh, except for they provide you a degree of um, acoustic control. So as I've, I've highlighted here, that the issue for these is um, obviously they cost more money than a standard opening window, and they also have quite a significant visual impact on the design of that facade. So the next step for us on this project was having agreed that this was a line that we, we'd like to look at, we looked at a series of design options um, uh, ranging in terms of acoustic performance and cost. So what we did was we um, generated a series of oralizations of different design solutions. So effectively for different sizes of acoustic event, different depths and different um, surface areas. And we presented those 
to the client and allowed them to subjectively make a judgment about where they wanted to be in that um, in that scale. Um, and they decided that it was worth having these acoustic vents and we did end up installing them and um, and you can see them here alongside the windows. Uh, and it's quite successful in the sense that you can go most of the year without needing to open your window. Um, you do still have to open it in the very hottest part of the years, but for the rest of the time, you are, you you get this additional protection from the external noise from the acoustic vent. And I think the success of that briefing process there was it's just the oralization gave us an opportunity to, to demonstrate to a client that this has some value to you, which we probably wouldn't have been able to get across otherwise. Okay, so as a second um, case study, looking at open plan offices. So uh, there's a couple of examples here, and the point here is that these are these look sort of similar, but they're quite different acoustically. So the key point for briefing on acoustic acoustics for open plan offices is that the requirements for open plan offices and offices generally is dependent on the nature of the task being undertaken. That can be highly variable between uh, different offices. So taking an activity-based approach to the design is the best way to do it acoustically rather than just trying to apply a one-size-fits-all process. But if we're going to get that right, we need to understand what people uh, are doing in the space and the range of tasks that they're doing. Um, so the first example is Keencham Civic Centre. Um, and this is uh, a sustainable office design. It's naturally ventilated. It has passive uh, cooling panels, uh, concrete panels. It's got CLT structure. Um, Acoustically, the issue here was that the the dominant type of work in this space was individual, quiet, focused work, um, and combined with the fact that it's quite a generously sized volume in terms of ceiling heights, um, it meant that the activity noise levels are quite low. And what that means is that the key acoustic challenge was privacy and and controlling privacy and distraction. Um, and because so, if you walk into a, a quiet space and start talking everybody can hear you and it distracts everybody. So um, that was the focus of design on this particular project. As a contrast, um, this project, which is a new office for Santander, uh, a Jack Carter Architects project, uh, which is a tender at the moment. This is completely different. It looks quite similar in terms of it's got the CLT uh, soffits, open design for natural ventilation. But this time, this is effectively a call center. and. We went to their existing uh, offices and you, you find that a very high proportion of people are talking at any one time. Combined with that, they they have very well controlled uh, rotors for staff, which means they have very high occupancy all the time. And what that means is instead of it being like the previous project where it was kind of more akin to a, a sort of library type challenge, this is more like a busy restaurant type ch challenge. And, and, and what we're looking at here, the design focused on having to increase the amount of absorption so that we could keep overall noise levels comfortable and stop people from experiencing stress over long working days. Uh, and we used oralizations to present um, to the client the benefit of adding increased areas of acoustic absorption. Um, so I need to wrap up really. But the point is that for officers, it's really important to use briefing. And we we found again that taking this kind of well-being based approach to, to the briefing is, is, is very helpful. So just to conclude, um, early stage input uh, is very helpful in terms of limiting the, the amount of um, design compromise which is required on the basis of acoustics. Taking a collaborative approach is always best for us because we're so reliant on other aspects of the design. We're, we rely on other disciplines to kind of integrate things that we need for the acoustics to work. And using this kind of well-being based approach to briefing um, we found that very effective in terms of engaging with clients and end users. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Anthony. I found that really interesting. And thank you in particular for teaching us a new word, oralization. I don't know how we managed without it. It makes so much sense, but I for one had never heard it before. Now, before we introduce our next speaker, I just want to remind you to keep sending your questions in so that we can have a great choice of questions for our first questions section session which will be after our next speaker who is Dr Oliver Wolf and he is head of building Phys physics at Geberit and therefore he works in their really extraordinarily complex and fascinating 
place where they can test everything you can think of and some things you can't. So he can really get into the nitty gritty of who, how acoustics work. Oliver. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to give a presentation about sound solution. It's embedding acoustics into building design. And I'd like to give you some insights to give it here. With a global presence, we have a powerful brand with an outstanding technology platform. We have a very successful business model and we are focused on excellence and organic growth. On the right side, you see a picture of the headquarter and Jona here in Switzerland. We're UK market leader and um, we offer to our customers a hands-on training academy. We have a hydraulics area, as you see in the right picture, and we have a showroom that offers the solutions and products to our customers. We invest in 10 technology areas. Simulations, drinking water hygiene, surface technology, materials, signs, hydraulics, fire protection, acoustics, process engineering, electronics, and statics. This is the Gibbert Sound Lab. This is the Sound Lab that we have here in our headquarter, and I must say it's unique in Europe. We do tests across four levels in this building, with a total testing size, a testing area of 1,750 square meter, which is really big. We're operating since 1997, and since then we gathered a huge amount of data, and that's um, one of our biggest assets that we have a very big database of acoustic measurements. This building is very special. It's fully decoupled. So when there's noise outside the building, this noise will not travel inside and might disturb our measurements. Within this building, we are able to test full systems. That means we can test across different levels and rebuild building situations with our presence in, in the building industry and that you find on the market. So what causes the noise? Well, first of all, noise is unwanted sound, but sound is subjective, so it depends on the person's perception. However, the perception also depends strongly on the, con on the context. So where you are, what you feel, what uh, time of the day it might be, and so on. And it's very important to include the acoustics in the design. I have a quote of a customer in hotel and resort area. Fine if you like listening to people pee. So here he clearly states that noise is annoying to him and he ranks and qualifies the hotel according to the acoustic noise. You see the sleep quality is just two. So what errors might have been made? Well, first of all, I think the wastewater noise is neglected in planning. Secondly, the insulation elements had direct contact with walls and floors. As you can see here, for instance, the floor standing toilet creates and induces structure burn sound into the floor. And uh, this creates a noise in the neighboring apartment. Some drainage pipes do not absorb the noise. It could be if you use just normal drainage pipes and do not cover them with a special material that also this drainage pipe induces structure bone vibrations into the solids like floors and walls and uh, might be the cause for annoyance in other rooms. So are there any regulations? Yes, there are. Regulations according the BSI standard. However, this is more a guidance document for acoustics because it states noise emission from hydraulic systems and so on is not to cause disturbance in normal use. That means there are not requirements in terms of numbers or decibels given, but these are just general statements to cause disturbance in normal use. However, this might this means whatever this means. And if you look for the word installation noise, you won't even find it, no entry found. So it's basically not covered in the standard. There's another standard, 
resistance to the passage of sound, approved document E. Here we have at least a slight guidance what we have to do. Either line the enclosure or wrap the duct with a pipe within the enclosure with 25 millimeter unfaced mineral wall. So this is just a slight guidance, but however, a really um, a defined value that you have to fulfill is not given here. This is different compared to other countries. When we look to Germany, Austria or Switzerland, the regulations are really based on fixed numbers that you have to fulfill. And these regulations are sometimes quite tough. So place design with acoustics in mind. We developed a very detailed understanding of the complexity of insulation noise. So we have a quite complex understanding of insulation noise. Oh, sorry, a quite detailed understanding of complex complexity of insulation noise. When we look to this animation here, I just played for you. We will see what happens to the noise in this room here. This might be the bedroom when your neighbor flushes the toilet. So imagine the neighbor flushes the toilet here and the water goes into the to into the bowl and then from the bowl into the pipe work. This creates um, an activation of this wall and the sound is radiated from this wall to your ear. This is shown here in this part. So the pressure versus time diagram shows when it becomes loud at your ear. So I start again and show the presentation. So you press the button here, the water comes down, excites the wall and creates this noise here. When we go down to this first peak, which is the most annoying peak, as you can imagine, you might realize that there's no water in the pipe yet. So according to the regulations in UK, when you only treat the pipe work, where you wrap it with some kind of lagging, it wouldn't help for the first peak. However, the first peak is the highest peak. Where does it come from? Well, the water hits the bowl, the bowl is vibrating, and these vibrating vibrations are transferred into the building structure, and the wall is vibrating and excites, uh, is excited, and this vibration is then converted into audible sound at your ear. At later times, for sure, the water is inside the pipe, and here the, the countermeasures with wrapping the pipe will definitely have an effect. But this peak, as you can see here, is not as high as the first peak. This animation is quite unique and has been presented at conferences, at the European conferences two years before. However, understanding the, the noise is not enough. We have to respect the different room types. Consider this is our building physics lab, and we have different rooms that we have to address. Well, there are uncritical rooms, and there are critical rooms. Your own living area, marked in a grave, is not critical because you're allowed to do as much noise as you like, but you're not allowed to disturb the neighbors. So the neighbor's room is a critical room, especially if it's a room where um, you you might uh, place your bedroom or your, your dining room or whatever. Uncritical rooms are also bathrooms because bathrooms are not considered to be a room where you stay for a longer period of time. So we have to distinguish between uncritical and critical rooms, and that's what we did also in our building physics lab. And we have to find proper solutions. The reduced acoustics from noise from the bathroom is, for instance, use the pre-wall system with acoustic decoupling. This stops the noise from traveling into the wall. Or use wall-hung toilets. This might stop the noise from traveling in the floor. And very important, use silent drainage piping. This reduces the noise directly at the source. So please hear the difference. Okay. 
and our solution. The difference in this case is about almost 10 dB. It's quite audible. How does it look like in reality? Well, installation issues affecting really acoustics, and these build, these pictures are horrible. When I speak as an acoustician, I think these are really horrible. The mortar bridges that you can see here, they eliminate the effect of the of the acoustic treatments here. And also the clamps here, usually there's a rubber inlay that stops the noise from the pipe to the clamps is covered with mortar. So it bridges the function of this rubber inlay. So it's not working anymore. There was a customer case study in UK I'd like to address. It was a building for mixed use. So it was used for as a restaurant and as a hotel. And we were asked in the very um, first, yeah, before, it's, before it was finished, we were asked to give a prediction about the acoustic value. Well, the high acoustic stand that was required didn't really match with the design aesthetic. When we took some pictures on site, we could see these typical mortar bridges. We could see that the pipe work was not straight, lagging was missing, and even the clamps here, the side, they didn't show um, an inlay that should have been made for acoustic decoupling purposes. For design reasons, the direct view on the pipes was required and the level that we estimated was about 60 to 70 dB. So at that phase, we could really um, do some predictions and help the customer with this project. Another project was done in Germany, were in a residential building, about 400 apartments were covered here. It was a challenge that the insulation noise was up to 40 dBA, but not when you flush with normal water. 40 dB was reached with this combination of water and solids. So the target was to achieve 25 dB that was reached with water, but together with solids, it was just 40 dB. We measured this value on site and tried to rebuild it in our lab. We used curd as a solid, and indeed we found levels up to 38 dB for this special configurations. So what to do? We did a lot of investigations, identified the problem, it was at those frequencies areas here, where the problem occurred, and we found the solution. The solution was to take DB20 pipes, use ISO lagging, use absorption inside the shaft, and use, this was very special, a special decoupling device for the pipe clamps. This was an invention. And soft fire protection sleeve. This is also interesting to note that the soft fire protection sleeve here prevents structure bond sound going from the pipe into the concrete. So these actions helped to reduce the noise level down to the required 25 dB target value. We did similar things with other hotels like the Fontenay Hotel, it's a five-star hotel in Hamburg, where we placed all our um, products here, especially dual fix insulation systems, silent DB20 drainage pipes, they were acting really as acoustic products that helped to improve the acoustics of this five-star hotel. We did the same also in Austria, a five-star hotel, Park Hyatt Hotel in, Wien, in, in Vienna. We proposed here Gibbert shower toilets, silent DB20 pipes, and Gibbert Hutter elements. These are lightweight elements that are also beneficial for good acoustics. Well, our solutions basically are lift the toilet off the floor. Use a proper flush plate. Use a decoupled frame, an installation set that decouples the toilet from the back wall, and use the turbo flush. Well, turbo flush is like, as you can see it here, and it reduces the noise by almost 10 dB compared to normal flush. And of course, use a proper acoustic drainage pipe and use brackets with a decoupler inside here. 
However, acoustics can be found in every of our products. If it's furniture, the pipe works, if these are shower toilets or shower trays or bathtubs, urinal systems, pre-wall systems, drain water, uh, rainwater drainage systems, solvent systems or faucets, you always find acoustics embedded in these products. Well, to sum up, insulation noise is really annoying and UK standards provide only a vague recommendation and only very little guidance on acoustics. However, architects and planners need clearer guidance and please keep in mind that the design with acoustics should really, should really start from the outset and not at later phases. Ensure good quality insulation practice. So think of these pictures with the mortar and Gibbert helps you. It offers a right range of support and solutions for your next project. However, you can read more in our white paper report. It's titled A Sound Solution and it embeds acoustics into building design and it's really the case for defining your UK standards. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Oliver. That was a real insight into the detail and thought that needs to go into getting acoustics right if we are not all going to be troubled by the horrible noises from other people's bathrooms. I mentioned earlier this uh, YouGov uh, survey that, that you've done at Geverit, which I know has come up with some extraordinary findings for the audience. Um, anybody who is more interested, and I really suggest you do this, you can download it. There's a button on your screen to allow you to download it. But just really briefly, Oliver, could you tell us what perhaps surprised you most in, in the results of the survey? Well, when I look at the survey, um, the most surprising thing that I've saw, I've seen is um, that more, oh, I'm reading it, um, 70 percent of homeowners are not even aware of of uh, regulations. And on the other hand, more than 50 percent are annoyed by, 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 by sound. So I think there's really a gap that we have to bridge now with this um, white paper approach. And I think this will benefit all of us. Thank you very much. And first question, please, Dave. Lots of questions about is the uh, presentation going to be available online afterwards? Yes, it is. And we will send a link. So if you're registered, we will send you an email with a link um, for Anthony. Uh, lots of interest in acoustic vents, uh, particularly in respect of Clapham Junction's development. Uh, lots of questions about acoustic vents, asking if you'd explain a bit more about how they would work. Over to you, Anthony. Yes, yeah, sure. OK, so. Um, there are different approaches, but the ones at Clapham, the way they work is that um, what they do is they allow the air to come through an opening um, where there's a series of horizontal um, foam elements. So as the as the sound passes through that same path, the sound gets absorbed by the foam on the way through. So it doesn't stop the air coming through. There is a slight aerodynamic resistance but it doesn't stop the air coming through but it does help to um, absorb some of the sound energy before it enters the room so um, the general issue with designing acoustic vents is there's always a, a kind of balance between the air performance and the acoustic performance um, and that's um, a large part of the, um, the design process obviously also the size and their the visual appearance of them on the facade is the other constraint thank you very much dave Oliver talked about international standards and product performance. What guidelines should the UK be looking towards and what can we adopt from international standards to improve sound performance? Oliver? Yes, thank you very much for this very good question. Um, I think the German standards are quite involved in that. However, the Swiss standards are a bit smaller in, in terms of number of pages when you when you look to the, to the to the standard. So if you'd like to have an easy one, a small one, I would propose to take the Swiss one. If you'd like to have a more fundamental one with more um, help for the designers and architects, I would propose to take the German ones. And I think the designers and architects probably need all the help they can get. Dave? Detailed question for Dr. Anthony for the use of CLT slabs in residential buildings. What are the options for acoustic solutions to achieve minimal thicknesses in the slab zone for a residential building with CLT floor slabs and what thicknesses would result? Oh, OK. It does depend a little bit on what um, sound insulation target you're aiming for. I think there'll be a bit of discussion about that in some of the subsequent 
presentations but if you're just trying to achieve party um, then that's one thing but then often you're trying to improve on that by 3 db 5 db perhaps more than that the key thing with clt is it's not very heavy inherently it's only about 500 550 kilograms per cubic meter um which you know compared to concrete is very low so acoustically our options are we add mass so we either have to put um perhaps a screed on top of it or screed boards um something to add mass and then the other thing is to have uh, isolated suspended ceilings um it does almost always end up being thicker than um than the equivalent uh, concrete based constructions just because um, we need the extra room um, to offset the uh, the lack of mass. Um, it's quite difficult and just on a side issue, it's quite difficult in residential to uh, keep exposed CLT to rooms. Um, it is something we've done in student resi, but in, um, in resi that's trying to get part E plus five, say it's quite difficult to do. You almost always have to line out everything with with the plasterboard. Um, but actual thicknesses is a bit of a detail. I'd probably have to look at a particular project. Thank you very much. Have we got one really quick last question, Dave? Does Dr. Wolf consider it to be essential to fit a vent pipe between the bottom of a stack offset and the top of the offset, or can careful attention to component selection and design avoid the need? Oliver? Uh, when we have this kind of questions, and we have this kind of questions very often, um, it really comes to the detail, and we have to look at the the drawing. We have to see uh, what's really uh, the building situation, because slight changes might have a big effect, and especially if it comes to vents, and if there's some openings, or um, there might be some some cause for a structure bone um, sound interaction, then it becomes highly difficult. So we. Uh, I'm a bit, bit, a bit puzzled now. I cannot just give the mm. answer right away. But if you could send it to me with this kind of picture, I would be happy to answer to this question because we have this kind of question very often. And I know it's a detailed question with a detailed answer. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank um, both you and Anthony very much again. And we're going to move on to um, the next part of our event. And again, we have two more speakers. I will introduce each of them in turn and then after those two presentations we will have another question and answer session. Uh, so our next question is uh, to Helen Sheldon of RBA Acoustics. Um, she has great expertise in the area of acoustics. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about um, acoustic design in residential development specifically. Um, I'm just going to skip briefly through these first few slides. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Helen. I'm um, an associate at RBA Acoustics. Um, I have a specialism in building acoustics, but particularly residential um, projects, including hotels and um, student residential and sort of all forms of, of residential. Um, we as a company have been around um, since 2002. We have offices in London, Manchester and Barcelona um, and I head up our Manchester office. Um, we do pretty much every single project type you can imagine. We work on almost every building going. Um, but as I say, today I'm going to focus particularly on the work that, that we do um, in terms of residential acoustic design and, and how that works. So just a quick sort of overview of the um, acoustic issues that we tend to look at. So the key issues when we're looking specifically at residential design is, is how much noise gets in from outside. Um, that might be um, uh, road traffic, rail traffic, air traffic, it might be industrial noise sources, it might be um, entertainment bars and clubs and things like that. Um, and the other key things that we look at is how much sound transmits within a building. Um, so that might be airborne noise, which would tend to be um, sources such as televisions or voices um, and how much they transmit through walls and floors into um, other properties. Uh, and we also look at impact and structure borne noise, which is more about how noise transmits as vibration through a structure. Um, and there's lots of different forms of that. You know, the simplest tends to be sort of footfall and um, furniture movements in sort of standard domestic situations. But you might also have noise transmitting as vibration um, for um, building services systems or from high impact activities such as gyms and things like that. So um, one of the questions I was asked to look at is how loud is too loud? And really the answer is how long is a piece of string? Um, there's so many variables in terms of 
um, whether something is considered too loud. It depends very much on uh, who's who's in that space and what are they trying to do. Um, some people are extremely sensitive to noise and you can give them the quietest situation ever and they'll still find something that bothers them. Other people, you could put them in a ridiculously noisy room and they won't care either. Um, but realistically, you know, most people are somewhere in the middle of that spectrum and that's kind of what we tend to look at. Um, but it also depends on the type of noise sources um, and how they sort of provoke a reaction in you to, to a certain extent, sort of anonymous noise sources and, and things you expect to hear like road traffic possibly don't bother you quite so much. Whereas, um, you know, the, the noise from your neighbour having a party and hearing the bass thump um, at, late at night will probably give you more problems. Um, the time of day is very important. Um, for me, actually, my most sensitive time is usually between 7.30 and 8.30 at night when I'm trying to get my children to go to sleep. Um, because once they're asleep, it's sort of half eight, nine o'clock, nothing will wake them. But actually, if somebody's being really noisy while they're trying to go to sleep, it causes me all manner of problems. But that's that's my personal situation. Whereas for many people, it might be trying to go to sleep at sort of 10, 11 o'clock at night is, is particularly sensitive or your lighter sleep times at six or seven in the morning where you get disturbed. Um, but in particular situations, um, actually the daytime might be more sensitive for, say, a care home where people are trying to get rest and relaxation through the day as well as trying to sort of sleep at night. So all in all, we kind of need to consider all of those things as we go forward. And we need to really design for sort of people behaving reasonably and having a reasonable sort of sensitivity to noise as well as a reasonable generation of, of sound. Um, so in terms of residential um, noise breaking into the building, how loud is too loud? There's, there's lots of guidance available. Um, there's um, sort of the principles are set out in the National Planning Policy Framework and the Noise Policy Statement for England. Um, although they don't give you any numbers, they're not going to tell you that 50 dB is too loud or 20 dB is too quiet. They're just going to say you need to think about noise and you need to look at how, how all of this is controlled. To get any numbers um, added to that, um, the it tends to be sort of local authority requirements, which are often based on guidance such as BS 8233 and the World Health Organization. Um, there's also a really useful document um, called ProPG um, about panning and noise, but to be honest, that's, that's a whole presentation in and of itself. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. Um, so in terms of um, residential noise ingress, um, as I say, a lot of um, Local authorities base their standards on BS 8233 and the World Health Organization, which have a very um, similar sort of uh, levels of recommended for sort of anonymous noise like road traffic and general environmental sources. Um, they tend to look at, we want noise levels to be sort of no more than around 35 dB in, in livable areas during the day and a bit quieter in bedrooms at night at 30 dB. Um, we also look at sort of their average noise levels. We also look at the sort of peaks um, in bedrooms at night to see whether um, you're going to get disturbed from that. The level that tends to be applied to that is around 45, but it's, that's slightly fluid because it tends to be sort of, it doesn't matter if one or two events or, or a few events go over that 45. So it tends to be sort of a, a normal situation. Um, whereas you know something unusual happens like a siren going past and that will be louder that wouldn't normally cause too many problems um as i say that relates specifically to sort of general noise sources if you've got something um more noticeable more with more features to it tends to be things like industrial or entertainment noise um sources you kind of have to look at it slightly differently you could design to those levels detailed in BS8233 from industrial or entertainment noise, and you could still cause sort of significant complaints because um, the nature of the noise is particularly annoying, uh, for want of a better phrase. Um, so we would tend to look at um, the background noise levels in the area, whether it's particularly quiet, whether there's lots of masking noise, and and what the, what the best sort of um, way to control it is. Um, where you've got music noise, often low frequency is, is an issue. And some, some local authorities have specific low frequency uh, noise criteria that they apply. 
and it's always worth looking at that when you've got that sort of situation here. The the photograph there is actually a sort of a new event space that was that was put in right next to a hotel. Um, the darker building is a, a relatively quiet restaurant that was converted into a, a sort of lively um, bar event space, and the the light building is a is a hotel. Um, and we had to look at how much noise was breaking out to that hotel and make sure that it wasn't um, excessive, uh, and that included specific low frequency um, noise limits as well. So um, moving on from sort of how much noise gets in from the outside, um, we also need to look at how much noise transmits inside. Now that is controlled by the building regulations, approved document E, um, and the, the basic sort of standards are detailed. They are very much minimum standards. They're what you have to comply with. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be good. Um, and many developments now um, adopt some form of enhanced standard. Um, it might be to get um, sort of sustainability credits, um, or it might be as a client requirement or a housing association requirement. But actually, quite often, residential developments are designed to a better standard than, than approved document E, just because um, the, the minimum standards are very basic. Um, the standards are slightly different where you make, when you're converting or where you've got rooms for residential purposes, which I'll touch on a little bit later. And in some instances, if you're looking at creating um, residential premises in historic buildings, you might find that limitations of listings mean that you can't... Um, uh, achieve the standards that you're looking for and that there are there are ways and means of sort of getting around that um if needs be but it's um but it's it can be a little bit complicated um the other aspect is that all of those standards are sort of looking at residential to residential um in terms of um residential to other situations which is actually becoming more and more critical as um the the sort of nature of residential developments is changing um approved document e has a note effectively that says you need to look at higher standards for anything which is which is not domestic um the key areas that tend to be an issue are things like in a large residential development you will often have um, retail, uh, cafe, bars, restaurants, um, at say ground floor with residentials directly above. Um, you might have gyms where structural noise is a huge issue. If you've got free weights dropping in a gym, that transmits just right through the whole building. Um, and it's becoming more and more common to have amenity spaces like dining areas, cinema rooms, and things like that. And we work on many sort of large multi phase residential um, with these situations occurring and, and we have to look at sort of where everything's cited and, and how that's best to be to be treated um but in in most situations you're going to need potentially really quite high levels of sound insulation in those situations um so just quickly going to touch on hotels um as a sort of side issue um, the, the principles are exactly the same. Hotels are rooms for residential purposes under approved document E, and so you are required to uh, make sure that the, the walls between rooms, if you're building a hotel or converting something to a hotel in England or Wales, um, you have to ensure that those rooms achieve a, a suitable standard. Um, the, one of the things with hotels is operator requirements are often different to what's required by approved document E. Sometimes they might be more stringent, but actually one of the most common issues is that they use different parameters. So often a large hotel chain will um, have their operator standards in terms of um, American standards and things like that. So you may well find that you've got an operator requirement that it needs you to have an STC say of 50 for that wall whereas approved document E says you need to have a DNTW for CTR of 43 and you know there's lots of letters there and what do they all mean well surely the 50 means that's higher than the 43 and that defines your standard and that's not actually true because all of those letters are really important and you'll find that if you build an STC 50 wall you probably won't achieve DNTW plus CTR of 43. So it's really important to get somebody who understands all of these things to look at these operator requirements and make sure that you're designing so that you achieve um, the relevant um, standards and all of the relevant standards. Um, again, similar to these large multi-phase sort of residential developments that are becoming more and more common, 
um, hotel spaces have lots of noisy uses in. You've got function rooms, you've got bars, you've got gyms. You might have a wedding going on in a ballroom and the rooms directly above might be, be um, booked by people who are not at that wedding. And so that the sort of the zone of all those sorts of things needs to be looked at. Um, and hotels also tend to be very heavily serviced. So um, you have a lot more plant associated with them than perhaps a typical residential development. Um, so just a quick pick up on a couple of those points. So where we talked about having to meet approved document E for separating walls between rooms in hotels, often you have interconnecting doors um, in certain rooms so that you can make them into family rooms, things like that. But because they can be let out separately, they still need to achieve approved document E. So um, when you've got that situation, you're gonna need sort of particularly high performance um, back-to-back doors from an acoustic perspective so that we can actually achieve those standards that we're looking at. Um, yeah, then again, touching on sort of operator requirements, um, some very famous budget hotel chains have guarantees that you'll get a good night's sleep. And um, as Ruth touched on earlier, noise is one of those factors that can affect that. And so there, the requirements tend to be um, really quite stringent. Um, and that means that you sort of have to be very strict on controlling noise coming in from outside and almost over designing to make sure that everything is going to be quiet enough um, but one of the difficulties with that is as you make everything inside uh, quieter you can potentially hear more of what's going on in the room next door because you're not getting any masking from sort of road traffic noise coming in things like that so that all sort of needs to be um, to be factored in as you're kind of moving forward so just to sort of finish up I thought I'd talk a little bit about peace and quiet uh, it's it's sort of fairly apt at the moment that you know through the early part of of the recent sort of lockdown measures you know a lot of people were um very happy about the increased level of peace and quiet as road traffic dropped and the the planes were grounded and trains were not running quite as much as as usual um it's it is important that people have spaces that they can can get peace and quiet in um we sort of I've talked earlier on about how we control noise to inside um, and you know whether those standards are appropriate or not is is up for debate, but they at least give you a, a reasonable level of protection. Um, but we also need to kind of think about gardens and external amenity spaces. Now, the sort of levels that are recommended by the guidance um, can only realistically be achieved in very rural areas, or if they are in urban locations, they tend to have to be very shielded, so like courtyards and things like that. Um, small balconies tend to be excluded because I think a lot of people would rather have a noisy small balcony space that they can go on than no space at all. And they tend to be sort of considered not actual amenity space, but really they're just meant for sort of, um, you know, drying clothes or, or just a little bit of extra sort of outdoor space. Um, but it's one of the things that needs to be looked at in the early stages of projects as you're going forward, because, you know, again, if all of your gardens are facing onto busy roads, then you're not going to be able to get that, that peaceful space um, that you would ideally be looking for. Um, it's, it's a similar kind of um, aspect, really, is that quite rightly for um, uh, for sustainability purposes and for sort of community purposes, it's really important that we're redeveloping brownfield sites and we've got sites that are close to transport links um, and things like that. And what we're trying to do really in, in a lot of these um, big residential developments is to uh, build a community where people can sort of live and um, have their leisure time and do all of those kinds of things. But it means by default you're close to railways and you're close to roads because you need those transport links and you've got gyms and you've got restaurants and you've got bars within the development because you want those to form part of your community um, but that proximity between noisy spaces and noise sensitive spaces has to be really carefully planned and really carefully designed to make sure that you can get that um, peace and quiet and that that sort of relaxation time I think that's me thanks very much thank you very much Helen I really enjoyed that presentation and I think it was an eye opener that we have to understand the way to get a balance between the peace and quiet that we all want in our homes and a vibrant sense of community and not having one intruding on another. That's obviously the expertise of people like you. Before I introduce our final speaker, just another reminder, if you do have any questions, uh, do send them in 
either now or as our next speaker talks, and we will have our second question and answer session after his presentation. And our final speaker is Ben Burgess, who is an Associate Director of Bureau Happold. And he has come to this subject through um, both actually working physically in the construction industry and a study of sound engineering. And now he is presenting himself as here as an acoustics expert with a great deal to tell us about. So over to you, Ben. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Burgess. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I am uh, Associate Director at Bureau Happold. Uh, I'm going to talk today about um, optimising acoustic performance. Um, so first of all, I thought it might be uh, interesting to just touch on the brief um, that I discussed with the guys um, at Architecture today. Um, and the first question was about how to approach acoustic design. And that's um, obviously quite a broad um, topic. And the way that, that I'm going to um, relate this, my, my interpretation of that, is that um, my, my sense of it, I do quite a lot of, uh, of CPD and, and talking and obviously engaging and collaborating with, with, um, with, with my architectural friends, is um, that, that it's quite often useful if, if these kind of presentations can generate a kind of a, a tangible take-home um, uh, benefit that, that, that people can kind of adopt straight away. And so what I'm going to try and do is talk about some of the key acoustic phenomena as they relate to buildings, um, and then give the sort of implications for the various architectural elements that are associated with each of those phenomena. Uh, and then I'm going to, the, the other thing that I discussed with the guys at AT was about producing workable solutions for architects and their clients. Um, and I've split that down into two case studies. The first one um, about workable solutions for an architect, um, which is on the BBC Concert Studios. Uh, and the second one about a workable solution for a client, which is on the, uh, the Bristol TQEC project, which I will, I'll come to later on. Uh, so how to approach acoustic design? Obviously, really, really super broad topic. So what we're going to look at here is uh, what we're calling the six factors in acoustic design. And these aren't the only factors, um, the only acoustic phenomena that, that exist, but they are the six kind of main ones that are common on every project, um, every sector type for every client. We, we pretty much always need to assess these six things. And the first one is noise break-in. So that's um, external environmental noise breaking into the development. Um, and typical sources are, are usually transport, so road, rail, aeroplanes kind of thing. Um, and it can impact on, on the occupiers of the development. Obviously, residential, it could be sleep and rest and wellness. Um, if it's a commercial development, it could be concentration in the office. Um, if it's a cultural development, it could be recording of music, that kind of thing. Um, and that has implications for architecturally things like facade design, um, ventilation strategy. So you wouldn't want to use um, uh, an open window ventilation strategy in a very noisy climate. But from a carbon and sustainability perspective, we'd really encourage that where, where the external noise climate permitted. Um, it also impacts things like the glazing buildup and the roof buildup, obviously all things which are preventing noise from breaking into the building. And the flip side of the noise breaking coin is, is noise breaking out of the development. Um, and that's the noise impact from, from our new development we're designing on any nearby noise sensitive receivers. And those receivers, um, could be residential, that's quite common, but also things like schools, hospitals, anywhere where noise um, could potentially be a problem. And the typical sources of external noise break out, uh, you know, almost always you've got external plant. Um, most developments have an external plant compound. Um, but if it's um, uh, a development which has high levels of activity noise, particularly from things like bands, um, DJs, amplified sound, obviously that can break out of the facade. And architecturally, the impacts are on um, planning. So very difficult to get planning for a development which you know, we predict is going to have a big impact on its neighbours. Um, and we need to normally um, suggest some means of mitigation and attenuation. Um, but also the, the, the same thing as noise breaking in because it's, this, it's the, the flip side of the coin. So our facade design, our ventilation strategy, our roof build up. Um, but also with the roof, if we've got an external plant compound, it might just be about space and structural capacity to um, you know, permit the levels of attenuation that we need on the roof. The next factor we're looking at is sound insulation. So a really common one. And sound insulation describes how well the internal um, architectural elements prevent sound from being transmitted from one internal space to another. 
Um, and obviously that is relevant for many architectural and structural aspects of design, things like walls, floors, doors, internal screens, and also critically, um, something which is kind of um, perhaps you know, brought about last, um, but really, really important are the, the details, so the junctions, the abutments, the penetrations, those things are really, really important in terms of providing high quality sound insulation. And you can imagine that our, you know, most sectors, residential, commercial, um, education, healthcare, cultural, sound insulation is, is, is really, really key. Um, and the next one is room acoustics, or um, sometimes that's kind of called reverberation control. Um, but it describes how noise is reflected, bounced around or absorbed in a space. And to kind of put it into context, if you imagine a, a great big cave or a cathedral, that space feels cold, you know, it feels acoustically cold. Whereas, um, you know, your bedroom or, or a space with lots of soft furnishings and lots of soft finishes, that feels acoustically warm. Um, and that's, that's a function of, of the, the quantity of reverberation in that space. And it's really, really important for um, performance spaces. So, you know, performers and audiences love spaces with good acoustics and hate spaces with bad acoustics. And that's all about the, um, the room acoustics and reverberation time. And architecturally, that impacts massively on, on, on the volumes of the space, you know, bigger volumes of longer reverberation times, um, and also the finishes. So, you know, uh, if it's all glass and marble and um, stone, then we get higher reverberation times. And the more soft finishes and absorbing finishes we get in there, the lower the reverberation times. Uh, and the final two factors that we're thinking about are uh, firstly, internal services noise. So that's noise um, which is either generated or transmitted by the development of building services. So if it's generated by the building services, that could be um, fan noise typically coming down the HVAC systems. Um, but also uh, what's critical to understand is that it can just be noise which isn't generated by the building services, but it's transmitted by the building services. So the, um, the second uh, example we have here, I'll turn the laser pointer on, uh, is uh, of what we call crosstalk. So the, uh, the noise source is, is, is somebody in one room, but the transmission path is via the common ductwork and it, it results in transmission to the adjacent space. So that has implications for things like the, the ceiling design, um, you know, the, the inclusion of bulkheads where needed to, um, to, to cover up building services uh, and also window heads, things like that. You know, if you need more attenuation, more lagging, then obviously it means you're going to have to set your window heads out at a lower level to facilitate that. And the final uh, factor we're looking at in acoustic design is AV and sound system design, audio, visual and sound system design. Um, Obviously, sound systems in things like cultural developments, you know, they are the experience. If you go and see a, a live gig, then, then then what you experience is the noise of the sound system. Um, so that's really critical. But also, um, it's really important for things like announcements, life safety. Um, you know, it could be PAVA, so voice alarm. Uh, if the building's on fire, uh, the, the, the speakers might be telling um, the, the occupants to leave via a certain exit. And so really, really critical. And what I'm trying to kind of get over here is that as a, as a take home message um, on this particular part that, you know, you could, you could see this almost as like a kind of tick list. And that if your, uh, your real estate design has information on the, on all of these six aspects at a varying level of detail, obviously depending on whether it's two, three or four sort of thing, you can be confident that the architectural design is comprehensive. So, you know, if you look at the, um, I don't know, the sound insulation design, and you look at walls, floors, doors, internal glazing, and you think, yeah, I've got acoustic design information and all that, then you can be confident that that part is, is dealt with. And that's the same for all of our six factors. And so what I'm going to look at next, next is uh, some case studies about how we, um, at Bureau Hubble Acoustics, have, have put that stuff into practice. Um, and the first one is going to be uh, the BBC Concert Studios development, and we're going to look at sound insulation. Uh, now, the BBC concert studios are um, on the old Olympic Park site, for people who know that. So if you're walking over the, uh, the F10 bridge with the aquatic centre on the left, there's a little spit of land to the right, which, which abuts the canal. Um, and this is the new home for the BBC Symphony Orchestra and the world-famous BBC Maida Vale recording studios. And uh, 
This is the obviously an external render of the development. It's currently in construction. And uh, this, this brown steel weathered cladding is a kind of um, a, a nod to the site's industrial history. So this is um, Eliza Morrison Architects uh, and Bureau of Household Engineering. And the other thing I want to kind of just touch on in this image here is that uh, the, 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 there's been a very deliberate attempt and success, I would say, uh, by um, allies to express the studios in the elevation. So what I mean by that is the main centerpiece of this um, of this development is the big symphony hall for the BBC Symphony Orchestra. And that's a massive single volume. And you can see that very clearly expressed in the external elevation. So it's the it's the big brown weathered steel box in the middle. And the uh, the kind of ancillary spaces which serve that main space, what we call the accommodation wing, are wrapped around the main box. You can see it going back here in a, in a precast concrete instead. So elevationally, you know that 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 studio, that volume is very much expressed. And this is what it looks like in section. So um, you can see the, the this main volume, the, the, the concert hall, which is the kind of centerpiece of the development, um, and uh, the accommodation wing with all its ancillary stuff sits over here. And underneath the low grade is where the, the new um, home for the Maid of Vale recording studio sits, and that's where BBC Rock and Pop um, are going to be. So we have um, a lot of very complex adjacencies. Um, you know, there are adjacencies between adjacent studios um, in the rock and pop section, and there are adjacencies between uh, practice rooms for the art for the artists um, in the in the ancillary wing. But the key one is um, this this guy here. So the adjacency between rock and pop at uh, uh, basement level and then the symphony orchestra sitting just meters above them. So there can be, you know, bands playing heavy metal or drum and bass or something really, really bass heavy in the basement, whilst, um, you know, the symphony orchestra are recording Mozart or Beethoven above. So, you know, the level of sound insulation which we require is, is absolutely astronomical, really, really high levels of sound insulation because if, if any of this noise gets on this recording, then the recording is ruined. And how we've achieved that from an engineering perspective is by adopting something uh, which is known as box-in-box -box, um, construction. And for those who don't work in the cultural sector, I'll try and explain a little bit. Um, but it's as simple, really, as having the external primary structure, which is shown in red in this, in this diagram here, completely structurally separated from an, a secondary structure, which is shown in blue in this diagram. So you have the external primary structural box, the red one, and an internal secondary structural box, which is the blue one. Um, and there are no hard connections of any kind between the two boxes, other than where obviously the slab, which supports the secondary box, has to sit on the primary structural slab. And where we, how we achieve um, structural separation in that, um, in that instance is by having a, a, an array of springs. And that's important because um, music noise contains a lot of low frequency um, content. And low frequency tends to transmit as vibration in the structure. Um, and so you can imagine that if um, you know, low frequency noise had been generated in the rock and pop studio here, it, it gets up through the structure. But then when it gets to the springs, the springs deflect and some of that vibration is lost. And so that's, that's how we've, we've isolated the two spaces from each other and allowed them to work simultaneously. Um, and so what, what we're talking about here is the, um, the aspiration for the cantilever. And this is the kind of aspiration that we're saying, you know, we, we made the architect's vision viable. Um, and this, again, was, was Allies and Morrison in the base build. Uh, some of the fit out um, is being done by um, Flanagan Lawrence. Uh, but the, um, the base build is by Allies and Morrison. And it's a very constrained site on the, on the, the left hand side is um, a new campus for the London College of Fashion. And on the right hand side is a new uh, Sadler's Wells Theatre. Um, and so one of the challenges um, that Nick um, Allies, who's leading the, the design had, was actually just achieving the gross internal floor area requirements in this very constrained site. And obviously cantilevering out um, when, you, when you can't move sideways is, is one way of achieving that. Um, but also it very much expresses this kind of stacked volume Props that we talked about before. And you can see here that, that again, that, that weathered steel cladding is the main 
um, the main studio, and they stacked volumes of the smaller studios alongside. And that's exactly what happens at the, the Rambert Dance Studios, for those of you who know that. This is um, on the left-hand side as you go over Waterloo Bridge towards Waterloo Station. Again, two stacked studios um, expressed um, through a cantilever. But the cantilever here is, is probably 600, 800 mil or something like that. Whereas the cantilever that, that, um, that, that the guys at Allies were aiming for at the BBC, this, this picture probably doesn't do it the justice in terms of scale, but it's about four meters um, along its, uh, its longest edge. And you can imagine that the challenge there was, was structural, right? We have this massive cantilever, but we've got loads of structure to incorporate in order to achieve this box in box um, design. And so what we did from engineers' perspective is that yes, okay, um, we have a full, what we call full structural box in box um, in, in the main studios, and that's you know primary structural concrete slabs, floating concrete secondary slabs, uh, precast concrete um, sides to the box, and, a, and a, an in situ concrete lid to the box, and uh, and those those box sides are supported by their own um, columns because the box is so tall, it's about uh, 15 meters tall, I think. Um, so those columns are know, 600 by 600 mil, really, really chunky stuff. And obviously that wasn't gonna work on a, on a four meter cantilever. Um, so what we did is developed an alternative uh, strategy where we had a lightweight system for, for use within the cantilever. Um, and instead of all that heavy concrete and steel work, what we have is um, a composite timber um, floating floor. It's still on springs as, as the main one, but the, the timber is, is, is layers of, um, of ply with a rubber damping sheet in between them. So you still get a very inert um, response from the floor. It doesn't, um, it doesn't transmit vibration very well, but it's way, way lighter. And that's uh, complemented with a, a lightweight multi-layer plasterboard um, side to the box and an independent joisted lid to the box. And there's still no hard connections between the primary and secondary structure it just weighs a lot less, and that totally facilitated the cantilever. And that's exactly how, I mean, these are obviously early concept sketches which we produced, but that's exactly how it's being built at the moment. So that's, we're going to contrast that a little bit with um, uh, an approach to meeting the client's requirements. Um, this is a, a new development for the University of Bristol um, called Temple Quarter Enterprise Campus. This is with uh, Field and Flight Bradley Studios. Um, and it's a huge development, a um, really, really big footprint. Uh, it's mostly a research building um, for um, some departments which are very, very, very noise and vibration sensitive, including uh, quantum engineering department, um, uh, the visual information lab department. Um, they do lots of recording of audio and video, so you can tell that um, acoustics is going to be an important thing. And here we're going to be looking at um, internal services noise and how that impacts the development. Uh, so here's a, a, a kind of a sense of scale of the development, really, really big, um, really, really big footprints. And that translates into some really, really big spaces um, for the research departments and things like, um, you know, large atria um, uh, that, that provide the circulation routes. And this kind of space, which is um, a collaborative um, working space where, um, you know, different departments, different groups of people, um, a kind of meeting to hash out ideas um, and, and, and formulate approaches. And it's quite a big volume, as you can see. And the challenge here um, is that what we want to achieve is for people to be able to talk to each other and understand each other very well without being unreasonably distracted by people at, at, at separate tables. And that's a function of the speech transmissibility index um, and speech intelligibility. Um, as, as I think uh, Anthony uh, touched on before in the presentation. And the speech intelligibility is predominantly a function of, of the, the level at which people are talking at, so how loud they're talking, um, the reverberation time in the space, and the background noise, which is, in this case, predominantly attributable to um, ventilation and, and building services. And it's rated on a scale from, from zero, which is you know, bad STI, I meaning you can't understand people, um, to one, which is excellent SDI, which means you can understand people really well. And it's kind of slightly counterintuitive, but what we actually want in this, in this instance, where we've got people multiply working in people, multiple groups working in the same space, is we want to have high STI within your group. So if you're with a table of two or three people, 
You want to be able to hear what they're saying really, really well. But actually, you don't want to be able to understand what people on adjacent tables are hearing at all because it's very distracting. Um, it's okay to hear some kind of hubbub and general background noise. If you can't discern what they're saying, it's a lot less distracting than if you can actually tune into the content of their conversation. And so what we did here is we looked at um, a kind of uh, a, a counterintuitive approach um, in that we actually looked at modeling um, the distraction distance. And that's the, the distance um, within which you can understand what a person is saying. And so this red dot here is um, of somebody speaking in a group and the blue area around them is uh, the area in which you can understand what they're saying. So what we call the distraction distance. And this first noise map on the, on the left is the distraction distance when the building services have been designed to NR35. So, you know, the kind of normal design parameter for the space. And you can see that the, 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 the distraction distance around this person is, is quite large. So um, anybody who's in that blue zone will be able to understand exactly what the person on the red dot is saying and probably going to be distracted by them. And so what we actually did in this design was increase the level of background noise. We allowed our friends in um, the you know, mechanical engineering um, department to actually generate more noise than we would normally um, allow. And all of that, that it's sort of, you know, it, it seems odd to improve acoustics by allowing more noise. The result is that the distraction distance, the, the area around the speaker that you can understand them is way, way, way smaller. And you can see that in the, um, you know, the, the, the comparison between the areas of blue. Um, and so what that means is that the, the background noise from the HVAC system, the, the ventilation, is actually masking some of the sound that's being generated by the speaker. And actually, in this case, allowing higher noise levels achieves a better acoustic environment for the client's intended use of the space. Um, and so just very briefly, some conclusions. If you can check that the design that you have addresses the six key factors in acoustics um, that we touched on before, we can be fairly confident that our schemes have you know, the right level of acoustic design to deal with the kind of best practice approach. So hopefully that's a tick list um, that people can take away. Um, the second one is that engaging engineers early in the design process is, is, is really useful. Um, and this, if the scheme's got a very kind of joined up collaborative design team, you generally get a much better approach. I mean, I, on, on the BBC project, which this is referring to, our um, structures, MEP, acoustics, fire, all the specialist engineering team were in-house. And it's very difficult to imagine how we would have designed um, the really um, you know, fiddly parts of the structural isolation if we didn't have that very collaborative approach. Um, but if you have got that, then you know, that can really unlock um, even quite challenging um, visions for, for, for the architectural design. And the final one is that you know, a lot of people say, oh, acoustics, that's the black art, isn't it? I mean, we're not um, engaged in the occult, most of us. Um, but some of the solutions that underpin the designs and the physics certainly can be quite counterintuitive. Um, and so, you know, the recommendation here is really if you can engage with um, in engineers who put so sort of people focused outcomes first, you know, they look at what the, the clients and the architects want to achieve from the building and then reverse engineer back from that to produce their designs, then you can um, pull off some really, really um, fantastic results from some quite unusual processes. And that's me. Uh, so uh, contact details there. Happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ben. That was great. And it's particularly interesting, I think, to see those case studies which show just how different things need to be for different examples, different clients and different needs. Um, can we have the first question now, Dave? Yeah, quick comment. Uh, Cathy said, Helen packed so much into that presentation, a real holistic approach. Well done and thank you. Um, and then some questions about doors. You mentioned back-to-back -back doors between interconnecting rooms in hotels. Do similar acoustic considerations apply to the room doors off the corridor? And also a supplementary question regarding student bedrooms within a cluster. Do you class them as rooms for residential purposes? Well, there's a complex question for you, Helen. Yeah, that's no, that's great. Um, yeah, in terms of the doors, yes, there are quite quite significant requirements for back to back doors between interconnecting rooms. There are also acoustic requirements on doors, entrance doors to flats, and 
entrance doors to hotel rooms and um, student residential premises they're not quite as stringent it's basically a solid core door with some really good seals and you're fine whereas the interconnecting doors would need to have um, a, a higher acoustic performance and a back-to-back -back, uh, with a cavity between in order to achieve because in that instance you're trying to match the um, performance of the wall whereas at the entrance doors you just need a reasonable performance off the corridor um, and the second part of the question was sorry Oh, it was something about student residences, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, the cluster flats. Yes, it's a, it's a complex one and it depends on how you interpret the regulations. Um, I mean, my view is that really um, the way the reg regulations are worded, ideally, if you've got student bedrooms within a, within a cluster flat, they ought to be classed as a room for residential purposes. Um, but it does depend on the specific situation. It dep depends on any agreements with your building control bodies and the client um, at the end of the day. Some building control um, bodies are, are fairly relaxed about it and consider them to be a flat with no real protection between the rooms within it, um, whereas others will be stricter. And the same goes in terms of some client requirements. Some um, some clients want that good level of separation between individual rooms, whereas others take a, a slightly more um, high level view of it. OK, thank you very much. It's obviously really important to understand what the local authority requires and what the client requires. Dave. The sound control and absorption that Ben described for the BBC Studios was extremely interesting. What can you successfully transpose from this application to the hotel and residential sectors? Ben. Thanks, guys. Yeah, well, glad to hear it was uh, of, of some interest to someone. Um, I mean, the, the, level, the levels of performances that we're looking for uh, generally on performance spaces and cultural schemes are, are way, way, way in excess of, of what we need from a, um, a residential or, um, uh, or a, a, a hotel scheme. Um, but the principles in terms of sound transmission and the physics are, are exactly the same. So, I mean, in terms of the, uh, the process that we, we're taking in terms of assessing the level of transmission, the things that you could, um, you know, the, the, the lessons that you could transpose from one to the other are things like, um, you know, the more massive a construction, the better performance that you get. Um, the stiffer a construction, uh, the better response it has to low frequency noise transmission. Uh, including cavities between layers of structure is really, really helpful. And even more so if you can have a, an, an absorbing layer within that cavity so that once sound gets in, it doesn't bounce around. It, it's, it's absorbed by a, um, by a material like rock wool or mineral fibre or something like that. Um, so although the, the, the targets are quite, you know, there's quite a, a big distance between the, the targets, the, the physics and the principles are actually identical. So things like mass, stiffness, cavities, um, absorption, all those things um, are relevant on every scheme type, um, just to a, a greater or lesser extent. Thanks very much. Dave? Impact noise through floors and sound transmission through walls is possibly the greatest irritant to occupants in new flats. Carpeted floors used to reduce the floor impact problem, but many new developments come with hardwood or porcelain tile floors, which are likely to exacerbate the issue. Uh, what suggestions on sound reductions do you have for these situations? Helen, what about uh, sound reduction when people think hard floors are the nicest thing to have? So the, the really important thing when you've got hard floor finishes is to make sure that there's a resilient layer in that build up. So what you have is carpets, are, carpets are brilliant at, at controlling impact sound. Um, but where you've got hard floor finishes, um, it really is necessary to make sure that you've got um, a good um, sort of rubber type layer. Um, within the build up so that you don't get so much of that impact sound going down to below and the other thing to be really mindful of is that um the detailing around that floor becomes a bit more complicated you, you put a carpet down and it, it does the work on its own whereas what you're trying to do with your resilient layer is make sure that that hard floor finish is isolated it goes back to the same principles as what ben's been talking about in the high performance spaces you're trying to isolate the surface that you're walking on so that that vibration from your footfall doesn't get into the rest of the building and transmit down. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's about making sure you've got a good resilient layer and that all the edge detailing stuff is is well done and you don't fix directly through it. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Dave, we've got one last really quick question. 
Yes. What is the success rate post completion tests compared to design rates? Uh, and um, the comment, great webinar. Big thank you to all for participating. <laughs> Who'd like to take that? I can talk about the pre-completion testing in in uh, residential developments because obviously there is um, requirements uh, under building control to test a sample of every development that, that is completed. Um, and I think generally speaking, these days, the, the success rate is relatively high. And in terms of the design, um, it's all the design principles are fairly well established for residential now. And um, you kind of we kind of know what we're doing. And if it's built right, it tends to work. Now, inevitably, there will be some failures. I mean, what tends to happen is in developments where you're cutting it close to the wind because you're struggling for space or, or whatever, and you lose a bit of your tolerance. You might get a few failures coming in, um, but it's it's relatively rare. What's what's most common is that there's been some sort of mistake in in the building of it. So again, often your walls between apartments are, are twin frame systems where one leaf has to be separated from the other by a big cavity with some absorption in. Again, like Ben was talking about, but if something gets into that cavity and bridges the two together. You just won't get the performance out of it. So it tends to be that something's been built slightly wrong if, if you're getting failures these days. I think that takes us partly back to the presentation that Oliver gave us earlier when uh, we saw again that as well as really careful design, we always need to get the construction right. I think that's a really good point on which to finish. Um, I'd just like to thank all our speakers again uh, for having given us such a great presentation. I think we should all have gone away uh, understanding more about how important acoustics are, how much we should think about them and why we should ask the experts. Uh, so a big thank you to our speakers. I big thank you to our audience for attending and for your questions. And I'd just like to thank you all very much indeed on behalf of Architecture Today and of Gebrit. Thank you.